Hi, my name is Nathan Hara. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Geneva. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to use advanced techniques for the analysis of radial density data, in particular the DACE notebooks, but uh, also some other public resources that, that uh, might be useful for the Planet Hunt Challenge uh, of this second summer workshop or for your own research. Uh, okay, let's get started. Um, the, I'm going to talk mainly about the DACE notebooks, which have an advantage over the graphical interface. Uh, it is that you have more flexibility for the noise model, which, which is a key aspect of uh, RV analysis. I'm going to walk you through um, the definition of base models of uh, the noise model and what exactly is computed in the periodograms and how you can use your noise model in the, the, in the, the computation of the periodogram. I'm going also to talk about other resources, which are not all the resources available for radial velocities. Uh, these are the ones I'm aware of. And, so, and uh, apologies if you have an excellent code, uh, which is uh, not listed here. Um, okay, downloading the notebook, uh, you can go to the GitHub page of the second summer workshop, which is host hosted by BJ Fulton. You can either fork the repository or um, download the code via this green button. You will have a zip file that you can unzip. And um, in the folder that you get, you have subfolders. You follow this path and in days, uh, you have a um, day's tutorial and you can open this with um, Jupyter. Um, the main, the central point of the day's notebook is the RV model class in which you initialize the data, so the times of observations, the RV data, <coughs> the um, RV data variances. So these are the nominal error squared and the instrument idea because you want, you want to tell uh, days if they, the data comes from your instrument number zero, one, two, three, um, depending on the number of instruments you have. And these fields here uh, define the noise model and we are going to, to see how uh, in the next slides. There is an important part of the, of the days notebook also, which is the Adeline um, routine, which adds linear predictor to your base model. And we will see uh, about that also. <clears throat> Just a quick reminder on how we define a radial velocity model. Um, basically, we have the data here, which is modeled as the sum of your physical model of the data plus some noise, which includes some physics also. The noise follows um, a certain uh, covariance, a certain distribution, which is in general assumed to be Gaussian. And um, we have also the key notions, which are the likelihood, the prior distribution, and the posterior distribution. These are some slides from the lecture on statistical significance of signals. And uh, I invite you to look at it if you haven't already. In the context of radial velocity data, uh, so we have this model, the likelihood is written in this form and the priors are written in this form, but we are not going to talk much about the priors. So this, this is just to remind you that it's the same context as um, the one in the statistical significance video. Okay, now, now noise models, this is something you need uh, to understand the days notebooks. Um, okay, so this is this part in the definition of the likelihood. We, as uh, always in the, the case, in the context of radio velocity, or almost always, the noise is assumed stationary, which means that your covariance matrix here, this uh, element on row i and column j is defined by a function which depends only on the time difference between the, the measurements i and j. <clears throat> the problem is uh, here you have to, de to compute the determinant and a matrix inverse, which is very computationally costly. So um, if you define your noise like this, 
uh, which uh, we have seen also in the statistical significance lecture. Um, the covariance uh, has a quasi-periodic structure, or if you forget about that term, uh, Gaussian structure. And for those metrics, well, um, you can't really escape the cost of uh, inverting the metrics. But you can um, change uh, slightly the definition of the covariance that you use. And you can use this one, which is uh, uh, the celerité model uh, from uh, Foreman Mackie et al. <clears throat> Here is a comparison of the uh, Haywood kernel and the, the celerité model for uh, a simple quasi-periodic kernel. And um, basically the difference is that this kernel uh, decreases, has a covariance that decreases faster at the beginning, but has lo a longer tail. Longer tails, yes. Um, and in the so, if you forget about the quasi periodic, the periodic component of the quasi periodic kernel, you see that it's the same behavior. Uh, the Gaussian distribution takes longer to decrease, um, ha has an increased correlation at the beginning, but then the exponential distribution uh, has a remaining correlation for uh, a longer time. And uh, the advantage of using this form is that the, ma the covariance matrix has a form which is called semi-separable, and the inversion is much faster. Instead of uh, n to the cube, where n is the number of observations, you, you are linear in n. And here you can check the celerity code. So in days, uh, we have covariance matrices, which are in fact a little bit more general than celerity, and they are called S-leaf models from uh, this reference. <clears throat> the covariances are written as a sum of a celerity matrix, uh, or a semi-separable matrix, in fact, and uh, a leaf matrix, which is defined as follow. Um, it is zero almost everywhere, except close to the diagonal. So the diagonal can be non-zero, and then you can have upper rows and um, lower columns. Uh, which can be non-zero. And this is particularly useful to model uh, calibration noise because if, for example, these two um, components of the co covariance matrix correspond to the same night, then the calibration uh, noise will be the same for all the measurements. So you will have a block of, uh, of correlated components. And um, even if we include that in the model, we conserve um, a much faster inversion, where we only have one extra factor, which is the average number of non-zero term in the leaf matrix. Um, so in this, the covariance is defined as follows. Uh, this, these are the classical uh, terms. Uh, this is the nominal error bars. Uh, this is the jitter, uh, the white noise that you assume uh, on top of the nominal error bars. This is the calibration noise. Um, this is an, an exponential decay noise, and you have a quasi-periodic, uh, um, you have quasi-periodic components. And note that you can add as many as you want. You can add several decays, several quasi-periodic components. It's not necessarily a good idea because at some point it's gonna be degenerated, but you can do it. Um, and so, the varkos Cooper for instance, corresponds to this term. This, this one corresponds to this term. Lambda corresponds to... Um, lambda Cooper is for quasi-periodic. It corresponds to this term. And nu is, um, is uh, the... corresponds to this term. Var exp is this one, lambda exp is this one. That's uh, transparent. And if you want to define a calibration noise, you just define a series of strings where uh, the, the night, the instance which corresponds to the same night, have the same string. Okay, now uh, let's talk about linear base models. Uh, so, in, in the context of exoplanets, your uh, deterministic model of the data is written in this form. And um, the statistical significance course, I defined it as the sum of Keplerian 
plus um, a certain function which represents everything else. And uh, just as uh, Jason Wright uh, said, um, in some cases you cannot ignore the n-body interactions between the, the planets, and so the sum of Keplerians is, rep is represented by a more complicated uh, function, which is which which is parameterized by, uh, for instance, the initial position of uh, the bodies at a certain time. Um, and here in days, this um, this function is represented as a linear function. So basically, we define a matrix and with the three parameters. But but this function is going to be um, linear. You can include the offsets. So it means that uh, you define some of the columns of the matrix to be zero everywhere except when the measurement corresponds to a given instrument where it, it is equal to one. And this is the syntax that you will use in the notebook um, to define the offsets. You can also define trends uh, in the form of a polynomial. You can add uh, a polynomial of arbitrary degree <coughs> to your model which might represent uh, the curvature from um, a stellar companion uh, which have very long-term uh, variation and that you, you might you might not want to fit a sinusoidal function on it but uh, a low order polynomial will do and also activity models uh, uh, as you may have seen in the day's tutorial number three um, you can smooth the activity indicators, in particular the S-index, but uh, also FWHM, uh, B-sector. Um, and in days it is done with a moving kernel. Uh, if you want to do it yourself with a, a Gaussian process like in um, Haywood 2014, for example, uh, that's uh, up to you. Uh, in general, except if you are doing something fancy like deriving your Gaussian process, uh, um, using a kernel smoothing or um, a Gaussian process will be, give similar results. Um, here, it, the, it is an example uh, of uh, HD 4307. <coughs> In um, orange, you have the row uh, log R prime HK of the Harps data. And in blue, you have the smoothed version of uh, the log R prime HK. And this is this blue vector that you're going to use as a linear predictor. And here it's the same, but for uh, harps, but after the uh, fiber update, which is treated as a different instrument. And in the notebook, this is the part which is uh, relevant to that step. Uh, something you need to know also is the, periodogram definition used in days. <coughs> um, in the statistical significance lecture, we talked about the, the general definition of the periodogram as comparing the likelihoods of two models. Here, you ba your base model is linear and the linear part is what you have defined um, before. So uh, this, uh, this step and this, and this step uh, have defined uh, this matrix that you're going to use in the periodogram. And you compare uh, this model to another model, which is exactly this one, plus a periodic component, which is, is here a sinusoidal function, which means that your alternative model is also linear. And you can write it like this. Um, maybe I'm going a little fast with the equations, but you can post the video and you'll see it's very simple. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, now you can compare the likelihoods of H and K omega, and uh, you, you can compare the K squared because your noise model is fixed. And uh, for, so for the model I is equal to H or K omega, you define the K squared like this, and the periodogram is defined like this. So it's basically, uh, do we improve the fit by adding uh, a, f um, a periodic component a sinusoidal component at frequency omega as compared to the base model and we normalize it by the, ba by the base model so that the periodogram is between zero and one. And note that here you can define uh, an arbitrary noise model, a fixed one, it's not adaptive, adaptive 
but it, it's a fixed noise model. But this might be useful uh, to, to explore whether if you have uh, assumed a certain correlated noise, this changes the shape of your parallelogram. And uh, so now uh, this is the principle of the parallelogram. And so what you do is to define a grid of frequencies. You compute the parallelogram, you compute the FAP of the, the false alarm probability of the maximum peak. And, uh, and um, you add a new planet at the maximum of the parallelogram uh, as long as, as it's below uh, the maximum number of, uh, of planets <coughs> that, you, that is user defined. And uh, once you have added the planets to your model, you refit everything with uh, the routine fit. So you see that here, uh, everything is done uh, in an object-oriented fashion where the main class is uh, RV model. And what it will look like is something like this. You will have uh, the residuals at one, at one point here. This is uh, the residuals after fit of the linear uh, base model. And this is the parallelogram computed with the base model. You see that here you have a significant peak. You, you fit it, you look at the residuals, you compute the parallelogram. Here you have a significant peak, you fit it, and so on. Um, a word about the MCMC. Uh, here in the context of a day's notebook, it's really easy to, to launch. It's, it's literally one line of code because you have already defined your model and uh, you might just want to specify the, the priors as the log priors and then you run the, the MCMC. And in that case, it is an adaptive uh, metropolis, <coughs> which is based on Hario et al. So it's, it's not uh, like um, MC, it's a, a different kind of uh, MCMC, but it works very well, you see that uh, here it can handle uh, a lot of parameters and uh, the, the convergence properties are really good. Um, finally, I'll mention some other tools that you can use for, uh, for the Planet Hunt Challenge of this second wor summer workshop or in your um, own research. First, I will start with a trick that I use myself. Um, if you look at the statistical significance lecture or what I'm talking about here, it's always about comparing models with K or K plus one planets. And so this, this, uh, this uh, has to do with uh, comparing models one to another. But it might happen that all your models are uh, very bad. And a way to check this is to say that if the model that you select is good, then the residuals should behave in a certain way. So, you know that weighted appropriately, they should follow a certain Gaussian distribution and they should not be correlated. And so this is a, a, a figure that measures the correlation. And so here is an example where I didn't use a correct model and my residuals are not as I expect. Uh, and I still see a correlation in the residuals. But once I have <coughs> um, the correct models, the residuals are distributed appropriately and there is no remaining correlation in the data and this is something I, I, I talked about in these papers and you you have also similar ideas in, in this paper by uh, Roman Balouef. Uh, also something that will that will uh, probably be included in days uh, in uh, pretty soon is also uh, something of my own research um, it's called the L1 periodogram, and maybe you remember for, from the statistical significance course that uh, I did an example where you have three planets in input and the maximum of the periodogram is at the wrong period. This is because you search for, in, in periodograms, you search for one periodicity at a time. And uh, if you want to look for all the frequencies, but for a computational cost, which is similar to using the periodograms a couple of times, you can look at this code. Uh, Planet Pack is a code written by Roman Baluef. <laughs> it's in C++ and you have all sorts of capabilities. You can fit uh, data, radial velocity data along with uh, photometric data. Uh, you have uh, all sorts of periodograms with uh, false alarm probabilities which are uh, implemented. And here, this is an example of the Keplerian periodogram, where you see that for a very eccentric, this is a very eccentric uh, planet, uh, and which is in this system. 
So this is a regular parallelogram. This is a parallelogram with several harmonics, which means that you fit one frequency plus uh, a component at two times this frequency and three times this frequency, three harmonics, 10 harmonics. And um, now you fit a Keplerian model and, you, and for each uh, value of the period, you take the maximum value uh, of, uh, of the periodogram you get by uh, exploring the eccentricity argument of periastron and, uh, and <clears throat> the other parameters which are linear in this case. And, um, and so this is the Keplerian periodogram when you go to eccentricity is equal to 0.6. And this is when you go to 0.9. And you see that you have a huge difference between the Keplerian periodogram and the other periodograms, even if you take into account a lot of harmonics. Uh, the code is in C++, so it's, it's fast. And, it's, uh, it's, um, and, and there are uh, plenty of uh, interesting comments on the model of noise. So I really recommend this reference. Um, <clears throat> The stacked periodograms, uh, which is uh, um, described in Mortier and Collier Cabron 2017. Uh, here, the idea is fairly simple. It's uh, you, you compute the periodogram, and each each uh, row here is a periodogram, but with different number of observations. And the idea is that if the signal comes from a planet, then the power should increase steadily. But if the planet comes from, if the signal comes from stellar activity, then it, it might go up and down and not stabilize very well, which is apparently the case for this signal. Um, okay, and, and something funny to mention is that the idea of stacking the paradigms one after the other was already mentioned by Schuster in his introductory paper of the periodogram uh, more than 120 20 years ago. Uh, okay, so, and also you have uh, Agatha, which is um, uh, Feng et al. 2017. <coughs> they introduce a, a general periodogram framework for the analysis of radio velocity data. And uh, one of the interesting things they do in the paper is to define the periodogram uh, marginalized over the nuisance parameters and not um, uh, maximized. Um, so this is a um, sort of a Bayesian periodogram. <coughs> and uh, so I invite you to check this reference. Um, also, I've, I've talked about uh, the evidence in the statistical uh, significance lecture. And I said that it's really difficult to estimate computationally. And you have a nice uh, code by Jean Faria uh, which is based on a nested sampling algorithm and um, which, allow you to, which allows you to compute uh, the evidence of a certain number of planets. Um, finally, uh, I'll mention Exofast, which is, uh, you have the reference here, it's Eastman et al, 2019. Um, the code is also publicly available. And uh, here you can uh, handle the photometry and the radial velocity at the same time. So if your problem is not so much about um, where, what planets are in your data, but you want to fit the data uh, uh, jointly to obtain the density, for example, then uh, Exofast is an uh, excellent reference. I have cited a few references in this talk and I'm just going to show them and scroll down for, for you to have the full uh, bibliographical records. <clears throat>